Okay, welcome back. Uh, all right, so we stopped at this. Jesus, uh, how do we relate to Jesus as a mediator? Let's get to page 47. How do we receive Christ's mediation of the new covenant? At page 47. Okay, so let's consider two examples. What? How do we, now we know that Christ is our mediator. Yes, right, he's standing there. How do we receive it? We know it, but how do we receive it? Let's look at two examples. Matthew chapter 8, 16 through 17. Read. When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word, and he healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Yeah. So look at this passage, right? People, not, not only this passage, this is just an example, but all through the old, old New Testament. Remember, Jesus was still Old Testament, right? So all through the earthly ministry of Jesus, people came to him in faith. Everyone say faith. That is the key word that we need. Faith. The woman with the issue of bleeding, I always think about it. It's a powerful example. She's sitting there. Eight years she has bleeding. Doctor said, we can't do anything. Go from here. But she's sitting here and she heard, hey, Jesus is passing by. Now, what happened to her? She didn't sit there and say, what should I do? Or she didn't sit there and say, okay, Jesus, who's he? What, what is it? Jesus is passing by. So what did the woman with the issue of bleeding say? Probably she thought to herself, this is my time. Jesus is passing here. One thing I know, Jesus is very busy. He's got a big ministry going on. People are following him. Two, I know that he may not come here again on this road. Three, I know that there are hundreds of people following him. But the woman with the issue of bleeding said, I am going to go. If I can only touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. Forget about talking. Forget about saying, okay, Jesus, you know, this is what happened. Eight years back, it started. Till... Forget about all of that. I don't need even a minute with Jesus. I don't want to see his face also. It's okay. If I, from the back, if I touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. What is that called? Eight. She had two choices. She could have sat back and said, I'm like this. Or she could have done what she did. Hundreds of people are following. She probably would have pushed everyone around being a woman. And it's not easy in, in during those days. You can't do that. But she didn't think about her value, what people will think, what he will think, what she will think. She went through the crowd and she probably, you know, like, just to me, I can see the garment. All I need to do is touch it. That's all I need to do. And she probably touched it and fell to the ground. That moment she was healed. Eight years of bleeding was stopped. And Jesus looks back and says, who's, who's that who touched me? Disciples are saying, you see, there are maybe 50 people this side, 50 people this side. Everyone are touching you. No, 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 no. Everyone are touching, but someone touched me in faith. Who is that? And she couldn't, you know, the Bible says that she was so, she was trembling. And she came forward and said, it was I. Jesus said, your faith has healed you. Faith is the key. Well, how do we receive what Jesus is doing as a mediator. We have faith in God. I love the passage of the centurion. It is so powerful. This Roman centurion, he doesn't know about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, guilt offering, sin offering, nothing he knows. He says, my servant is not well at home. Can you pray? Jesus said, okay, I'll come. What would you and I do? Come, I'll show you the house. Please come. 
the Roman sense is, no, no, no. You don't have to come. Just say the word and he will be healed. This is too much. Now, he doesn't know Abraham, Isaac and all. He doesn't know the covenant blessings of the of all of that. He is a Roman centurion and he's a well-off person. He's saying, I've got people under me. If I say come, they'll come. If I say go, they'll go. I'm just coming for my servant because I've heard about you. You don't have to come till that. You just say the word, he will be healed. And that's why the following passages from there, it says, Jesus says, this is the only place, great, I mean, Jesus was marveled. Have you, can I think about that? Jesus was marveled. Oh, you're a Roman and you're telling me this. You're a Gentile. You're telling me this. You've got like hundreds of Jews here who are there who don't have this kind of faith. But you are a Gentile and you're saying this. Jesus was marveled, surprised. Imagine Jesus being marveled. When we exercise our faith, we stand on greater faith. Jesus was marveled. And as his word says, when we speak in faith, when we act in faith, we will receive what we've prayed for. Right? One of the most important ways to receive is to walk in faith. Jesus will enforce the blessings upon us. His covenant will not fail. When Jesus says, I'm the Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals, that's his covenant. He will enforce his covenant. We've got to stand in faith. We've got to stand and say, yes, God. Is it easy? The doctors may give a report. So they will, the doctors have given a report, but here you've got Jesus. He's saying, don't look at that report. Look at what I'm saying. I'm saying I'm the healer. I will give you life. I've written every day of your life in my book, and my book says, you still got many years to live. Remember, I was reading this yesterday. King Hezekiah. It's, it's there in the book of uh, Second Kings, right? King Hezekiah is a king. Isaiah the prophet comes and says, okay, put your house together. You're going to die. Set yourself up. Right. That means get ready. You're going to die. Hezekiah turns to the wall and he cries bitterly. As a king, he cries bitterly and he says, God, don't do this. Isaiah is going out. God speaks to Isaiah and says, before Isaiah could even go out, God speaks to Isaiah and says, go back inside. Tell King Hezekiah, I've heard his cry. Now I'll extend his life for another 15 years. That is a God who, who, who is, he knows us. He knows that there are fears. He knows that is worry, that is doubt. But he also knows what we can achieve when we walk in faith. Right? So one of the most important ways of receiving the blessings of the new covenant is to walk in faith. I was in Mangalore in 2021. The doctor, my father was admitted in the hospital for COVID. It was the second variant, which was the most, it was very dangerous, right? So he thought it was fever, just like everyone, right? He thought it was fever. He kept taking tablets, didn't suppress. Finally, they took him. There was no hospitals. It was a terrible, terrible time, right? And somehow in a government hospital, they allotted him one bed. It was such a bad place. I was in Mangalore. I heard the news. And my brother, you know, he just told me, you know, dad's in the hospital. I, we just prayed. But one day he called, he did a video call to me and he had all that. He, there was no ventilator available, but he had that oxygen thing. His oxygen level was somewhere around 50%. It's supposed to be, you know, 90, I guess, 80, 90. It was 50. The doctor said he's not going to live because he's above 60. He's, he was 68. He's not going to live because he's, he's old and there's no ventilator available. And he felt that this was his last day. So he did a video call and he said, I want to see the kids. Can you show the kids? He couldn't talk. He just, because he had that thing, he couldn't talk. My heart sank as a son looking at the father, my father. He said, this is, I, I, I don't think. And then my, I spoke to my brother. He said, why, what's happening? He said, no, he feels that this is, 
I said, no. No. We will stand in faith. We will stand and we pray. We will ask God for healing. So I left Bangalore. I came to Bangalore. Went to the hospital. We did everything in the natural. We called up hospitals and hospitals. Nobody has a ventilator. We, we met the doctor. The doctor would come once a while. The doctor would come. And, he, and I got to speak to him. I said, doctor, how is my father? He said, without a ventilator, he will not survive. If you get a ventilator, take him from here and go. There's no ventilators. The scene was so bad that people were dying left, right, everyone. Just, they're just dying. The bodies they're taking. In. It was a natural thing. Death was natural here. It was just a common, like killing flies. They, people were dying. We were, I was in the cafeteria in the hospital, and I'm seeing dead bodies with the stretcher. They, I saw all of this. My faith went all the way down. I said, God, what's going to happen? What will I tell my children? My children are so attached to my father. I said, God, do something. I'm going to stand in faith. I'm very weak right now. I cannot do it. There is medicine. It's an impossible situation now. There's no ventilator. There's medicine. People are dying. People who are in their early 30s are dying. My dad is 68. I said, God, I don't care about all of that. I'm going to stand on your word. I'm weak. I'm not strong. I may be pastor and all of that. But now, nobody cares. The devil doesn't care about you being a pastor. Now is where the real test is. God, help me. I said, no. He will live to declare the word. We began to just declare the promises of God. As, as a family, we began to pray. The doctor said, maybe if he doesn't get a ventilator in a week, he's going to go because that it's coming lower and lower 58 54 50 he could you know it was a government hospital if he has to go to the restroom the restroom is there he cannot take out the oxygen and go if he goes he he can't breathe he can't even go to the restroom he can't carry that gas it's a you know oxygen cylinder he can't carry the cylinder and go there they're giving the food, they'll give the food and they say, you come and take it because they're all COVID patients. How can he walk? He can't even hold the cylinder. You've seen those cylinders, right? Oxygen cylinders. They're saying we don't have cylinders left. After this, we don't know when the cylinders will come. So if there's no oxygen, how will he live? It was too much for me to bear. I know my father's there in the hospital. But I remember this. We stood on God's word. I said, God, nothing is in our hands. You are the mediator. You know everything. One week later, he walked out of that hospital. He said, come, we get a wheelchair. He said, no wheelchair. We'll walk out. We walked out of the hospital. It took him a week or so to recover. and or More than a week, actually. And God restored his life. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. For God, you are with me. Your rod, your staff will comfort me. That's why, you know, death is just a shadow. Even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, it was too much. There was nothing that we could do but only put our trust in God, put our faith in God. Only you can do it, Lord. Nothing else. No, no, no other thing is possible. Only you can do it. And when we come to that kind of a situation, that's when we surrender everything to God and we walk in faith. So that's what God wants us. Every aspect, He wants us to walk in faith, right? Okay, chapter 11. Let's go to chapter 11. Our covenant blessings, our new covenant blessings, what are they? As new covenant, understanding our new covenant privileges, our provisions and blessings. We talked about identity and a lot of it could be a repeat here. We have the nature of God, right? Uh, we have certain privileges, we have provisions and we have blessings of the new covenant. We have the nature of God. 
God says, I will bless you. He means all who he is, he's making it available for you. I will bless you. What do you need? You need life, I'll give you life. You need strength, I'll give you strength. You need healing, I'll give you healing. You need deliverance, I'll give you deliverance. All that he is, he's willing to give it to us. Right? He says, I will bless you. Look at Acts 3.25. You are sons of the prophet and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. We have God's word. We have the word of God with us, which is very important. We have the promises of God's word. Sometimes, you know, the mistake we make is we try to, when we pray and we pray and we ask God, and we want a prophetic word, all that is good, right? We want God to speak to us directly. Sometimes God is saying, you hold on to the promise. You have the word of God. No, that is I'm that is God speaking to me. So I'll give you a promise. You hold on to that promise. Right? Isaiah 43. I remember during that time uh, when my dad was in the hospital. Isaiah 43 came to my mind. Isaiah 43 says, when he walks through the waters, I, I may not know it exactly, but when he walks through the waters, I am there with him. The, it will not overtake him. I will be with him. He will, you know, a, a, a song of, a, 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 it's a words of deliverance. I will be with him. It will not overcome him. No sickness, no disease, no storm in life will overcome him because I'm there with him. Right? Abraham's blessings are included for us. We talked about this. Deuteronomy 28 has all the blessings that God has promised us. All of that is for us. Old covenant promises are our minimum. So, what is our maximum? Way up. Jesus, the new covenant is so much more because that's the maximum new co old covenant had wonderful blessings there's deliverance protection healing blessing prosperity victory over our enemies that is the minimum that means when you enter into covenant with god this is minimum minimum guarantee signed by god now above that you want something extraordinary i've got the new covenant the cross is there Jesus is the mediator. Use it. It's minimum, maximum is there's no maximum. God is able, right? He's able to speak into dead bodies and bring life. When he made Adam, he made him with the sand and he blew into Adam, into his nostrils, and he made him a breathe. God can make organs and put it into our body. He can make a liver, he can make a kidney, he can make a new stomach, he can make it because he's supernatural. I always wonder why Jesus put spit on the mud and make a paste and put it on his on the blind man's eyes. He said, go and wash it. God is a God who creates out of nothing he created. He just took sand, he created a... Adam and Eve. Adam, he blew into it. Became a person. You think it's hard for God to create organs? Not at all. Not at all. I can share plenty of testimonies. Uh, people, God has created new organs for them. Where women without a uterus have given birth to children. They have. God doesn't. All of that is limitations in our mind. Why? Because we limit our mind to God being this way. God is not that way. He's above that. Right? He doesn't work on our timeline. So we must understand there's a maximum. New covenant, Ephesians chapter, every spiritual blessing in Christ, Ephesians 1 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Here you got the natural blessings of deliverance, protection, healing. And here you got the spiritual blessings. What are some of the spiritual blessings? Forgiveness. 
justification, sanctification, assurance, healing. Healing not just in the body but in our spirit. You can have a fit body and a broken spirit. Right? You can have a person who is extremely fit. All the organs in their body is perfect. Hemoglobin, uh, protein, calcium, all the levels, blood count, everything is perfect. But he's always in the bed sleeping. Why? Because it's a broken spirit. Eventually, that broken spirit will cause effect on the body. Right? But God has given us uh, every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Everything Jesus provided for us through the cross, the cross has completed the work. And next, we'll, next session, we'll talk about the cross. Here's the best part. We are all qualified to partake it, partake of it. We are all qualified. Tall, short, fair, dark, mature, immature, English, any other language, educated, uneducated, from a city, from the village, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter at all for God. We're all qualified to partake of what Jesus did on the cross. We're qualified, right? Colossians 1.12, giving thanks to the Father, who qualified us to partake to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Look at this verse. Giving thanks to the Father. You see, giving thanks to Jesus. Because the Father has qualified us to be partakers of what Jesus did. He's saying, okay, now when I look at you, and when I look at these people, I look at them through the eyes of Jesus, through the eyes of my son. Just as I love Jesus, my only son, I love all of them the same way. Same love. That's why John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He loved it so much. He loved us so much that he gave us. Right? So we are all partakers uh, um, of, 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 the, of the inheritance of the saints. So what are some of the ways that we can receive these, this covenant blessing? Right. Uh, we'll finish this and close. Right. Any questions? Any thoughts? Uh, anyone seems so quiet. Any questions? Any thoughts? I hope, I hope you're you know, just taking in and understanding. Right. If you have questions, feel free to share. Right. Okay. Yeah. There's a question here. About that lady, she and she touched the garments of the Jesus. But what, what if she could not touch that garment, but still she had faith? That's a good question. Now, see, remember that the Lord Jesus knows everything. In the book of Revelation, it says he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. There is a reason Jesus passed that way. I'm sure Jesus knew that there's a woman going through this problem. I'm going to give her the opportunity. In some places, Jesus went to people. Right? Remember the woman, the man who had who couldn't walk. At the pool of Silo, he goes to Jesus. Jesus goes to him and asks, Do you want to be healed? He didn't say, Jesus, I'm here, please heal me. Right? Jesus goes to him. So here, Jesus gives her the opportunity. Okay? So, uh, meaning, I'll come. But if she wants her healing, she'll have to come and touch me. It's not like Jesus is saying, I'm, you know, I'm, I am who I am. So let him, let them. No. Sometimes, that's what Jesus does. He wants. He wanted her to express her faith, right? So in the time that she was living, she went and touched. Even if she didn't have, even if Jesus was not there, 
right? But God orchestrated that way. If Jesus was not there, not walking, maybe, you know, if you look at it in another way, maybe Jesus would have made her to come and, you know, just uh, attend one of his uh, healing services or... Uh, but the point is, God knows how to deal with this, right? So the point is not what if Jesus was not there, what if Jesus didn't come. The point is, she exercised the faith, and faith made her well. So now for us, how do you and I apply it? Right? You and I can apply it in a way saying, hey, Jesus is always with me. There it was the physical Jesus, easier. Physical Jesus to touch is easy. Yes or no? Ah, Jesus is there. No. We'll go at full confidence. How many of us will do that? We're seeing Jesus. Full confidence. We'll know. Okay, healing is there. But now where is Jesus? He's not there at all. Right? But he's there. All we have to do is to reach out. So even... See, God knows the measure of faith we have. So this woman, even if Jesus didn't pass by, God would have had a plan to honor that faith that she had. So you can always think of it that way. So even if Jesus didn't pass by, God would have brought healing in a way for her. See, God is beyond time and place. Right? You can be somebody in another country and you pray here, healing can happen there. So this... God is beyond time and place. It was that situation. Jesus was there. He was doing his earthly ministry. And he wanted us to learn a lesson from that. Right? That when you reach out in faith, you'll get healed. And so for us as believers, know that, okay, Jesus is always with us. And when I reach out in faith, he will touch, he will heal. Okay? There's a question here. While praying for the sick, is our faith important or the faith of the person who is sick is important. Now, Andrew, so both are important, right? Now, when you look at the earthly ministry of Jesus, uh, there were places where people had faith, right? People had faith and they they expressed their faith like the woman with the issue of bleeding. So, uh, expressed faith, got her healing, happy. What about, you know, the uh, paralyzed person, the four friends opened the ceiling and they drop this paralyzed person down what did jesus say because of the faith of your friends this person is going to be healed right so both are important now remember that each one of us the bible says that each one of us has a measure of faith so andrew all of us have a measure of faith no matter where once we become believers we have a measure of faith how do we build on that faith? By hearing the word of God, by exercising that faith. So if I'm praying for somebody, and for example, that person doesn't get healed, doesn't mean he doesn't have faith and I have faith. He has faith. Always remember, the end is God is the one who heals. right? So what, or what if that person has faith and I'm praying and I have less faith? Oh, maybe because I have less faith, this person is not healed. That is a wrong understanding. We must come to God in faith, saying, God, I'm not coming by my own ability. I am coming through the cross. I'm coming because this is what you've done for me on the cross. I have faith on that word. On the word I have faith. Not on my... I don't have faith on my faith. I hope you understand. I don't have faith on my faith, but I have faith on the word of God that you said, I am the God that healeth thee. So I will stand on that faith. I know, you know, especially when you're praying for people and, um, you know, they're going through a disease or a sickness. It's very difficult. I understand that completely. It's very difficult when, you know, people are praying for us and we know there's a sickness and, and you know, it's, it's very difficult. But we are not standing on our faith. We are standing on the word of God. This woman with the issue of bleeding 
had faith that if she touches the hem of the garment, right? So, Andrew, to answer your question, both are important. But remember, God can work independently. I didn't know I'll become a pastor. I didn't know I'll become a preacher. I didn't know I'll become a believer itself. I, wa I didn't want it. But there was faith of other people who prayed. My parents, my family members who prayed and said, God, you know, you have chosen him for the ministry. When you were, when you were small, you, know, you gave me a word. You gave me these promises. Now he's not in the Lord. He doesn't want to be near you and he doesn't want to connect with you. But Lord, you use him. The prayers of them, I didn't have faith. But their prayers, the prayers of faith of the parents, God answered. And then when I became a believer, I began to grow in my faith. Right? So, Andrew, I hope that answers your question. Both are important. Right? But God can work independently. Right? Okay. Okay, let's get into chapter 12. Uh, receiving covenant blessings. Uh, just four points here. Uh, and most of it is going to also, you know, we may have covered. Number one, obedience to his word. The psalmist says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Acts 20, 32. Now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. What builds us up? The word of God. Ephesians 1, 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his, in, of, the, of his inheritance in the saints. This is why we need the word of God. We need the word of God. It is not just a poem that was written by people. No, it is the life-giving power of God. That's what the word is. Every time we read the word, and we declare in faith, what you're doing is you're destroying, you're confusing the plans of the devil. So, for example, you feel weak and weary. You feel, oh, what is life? You know, I don't want to live this life. Suddenly, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's just one sentence. But that sentence is filled with the power of God. That's what the word is. And so I become obedient to that word. And no more I'm thinking I can't do. Every time is I can do. I can do. But people are doing you, saying you can't do. You can do. You can, you can, you can, you can. Everyone say, I can. I can, yeah. You can do all things when you obey the word of God. God's word is written in our hearts. It's written in our minds. Oh, what beauty. The word of God is like living water. It refreshes us. How many of you on a good summer, you know, when you were children, you've played the whole summer, like a whole day in a hot sun, you played cricket near your house or football, you've played. And then you've come back home and it's, it's you know, scorching hot outside. You come back home and then your, your mother or your father gives you watermelon to eat. You take that watermelon and you eat it. Uh -huh. What happens to you? Refreshed. Or you go back home. All this happened to me when I was small. I'll come back. It's summer holidays. It's hot outside. Dust and play. You're sweating. Come back home and your mother comes and gives you musk melon juice. Ah. Drink it. Oh, I feel refreshed. Then you say, go have a bath. You have a bath. You come back. Oh, I feel fresh. That's what the word of God is. When you read the word of God, it refreshes your spirit, man. It strengthens your spirit, man. Lord, I feel weak, I feel tired, I feel weary. The devil is, you know, putting all kinds of thoughts and, you know, pictures and things in my mind. I'm getting tired. I'm not able to sleep. I'm not able to eat. I'm not able to do anything, God. 
What do I do? I'm tired. I'm not doing anything. I feel so suppressed. There's no peace. I'm not able to even close my eyes. A few minutes I close my eyes, the devil brings these thoughts. I'm not able to. What do you say at that time? You speak the word of God. You speak and you say, I have the mind of Christ. Devil, you have no authority over me. I take captive every thought of the devil and I pray that, that Lord, you are with me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. What are you doing? You're declaring God's word. You're not saying poems. Right? It's not some uh, book that somebody has written and you're saying, no, you're speaking the word of God. If God is for me, who can be against me? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You, you're declaring all these verses. The weapons, Satan, I put on... Ephesians 6 says, I put on the armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth. I'm putting on the armor. At home, you may be wearing track pant and t-shirt. But when you pray, when the devil sees you, you are like a Roman, like a soldier. You've seen those soldiers, no? With a helmet, with a breastplate, with a shield, and with a spear, and you're ready. The devil is saying, how do I attack this guy? Where's the place? He's fully covered. Oh, there's a place there. Let me try there. He comes to try there. Suddenly he's seeing somebody else next to you. Who is that? Jesus is standing there. Oh, no. If the devil, the Bible says, if the enemy comes in one way, he will run in seven different ways. That's what happens in the spirit. In the natural, you're in your room, you're praying. You're not even screaming. You're not even shouting. You're just praying. Simple prayer. Lord, I'm not able to... But I put on the armor of God. In the spiritual, it's different. Just because we scream and pray doesn't mean no, Satan is worried. Satan is worried when you know what you're praying about. And you know who you're praying to. You understand that, right? Screaming and shouting will not is not the... Yes, through the anointing, we, we, we are energized. God strengthens us. We, we shout and praise God. That's good. But in our weakness, that's the real test. We can go to God. Obey His word. Walk in love. Walk in purity. Walk in holiness. If you have, you know, don't be running behind people for prophetic word. Have you heard, heard, seen people? They're always running. Can you give me a prophetic word? Can you give me a prophetic word? Don't, do, don't be that kind of a person. The word of God is a prophetic word. If you are reading God's word, you're reading God's promise for you. But how do I know what is the future for me? Jeremiah 29, 11, he's written uh, thousands of years back. I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, give you a good hope, good future, says the Lord. That's a prophetic word. Use it in your life. Why you want somebody to pray for you? Now, it's not wrong, right? I've received many prophetic words. I receive it, okay. But my obedience and my faith is should be in the word of God. Okay? So don't go always running behind that. Two is exercise faith. When Jesus ministered, he ministered in the old covenant. Right? And now we are in the new covenant. So when Jesus ministered, he ministered in a way that, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to defeat the devil. So now devil... Since you're already defeated, this is what I will do. I will walk on water, raise the dead, open blind eyes, cleanse the lepers, because I'm going to do that. I'm going to pay the price on the cross. Now, after the price is paid, I will go. Then my children will take it up. That is you and me. They will take it up. And they will exercise faith and walk in the steps that I walked in. Walk in the steps of Abraham, the man of great faith. They will be like that. Right? Obedience, right? sorry, exercising faith in every area of our life. I, and I was listening to this uh, sermon. It's a very powerful sermon. It said that the number one thing to do to exercise faith is to remove worry and fear. Fear and worry. First thing you do is you remove your fear away. Is it easy? When I heard my father was in the hospital, I know all this. 
remove fear. But fear was there. It's easy to say, no. Pastor, you're telling. But you've not gone through it. I have gone through it. Very fearful. Think about this. Your father is calling you in a video call and saying, I think this is the last time I'm talking to you. Do you think I would have been happy? Do you think it's a thing that will not bring in fear? That whole night journey coming to Bangalore, I didn't close my eyes for probably an hour or so. How can you sleep? There's fear. And the enemy is putting all these thoughts. What if this happens? What if death happens? Who will be there with my mom? Who is going to, uh, you know, what am I going to tell my children? What am I going to tell uh, the other families? What about the other neighbors? What will I tell them? How can I see my father here? In uh, uh, You know, I, all these thoughts started flooding my mind. <laughs> will it flood our minds? Yes, natural. That is the moment you should say, rebuke that fear and say, God, I'm not going to think of this. I'm going to stand in faith. It's hard. But that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. That's where we use God's word. We exercise faith. Right? Take it by force. Right? Matthew chapter 11 and verse 12. Let's know. Let's read Luke 13, 16. So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years, be loosed from this bond, bond on the Sabbath. Now, it's the Sabbath day. Jesus has gone to the temple, and this woman is bent over. Have you seen some people nowadays? You've seen them, right? They're completely bent. So the same thing. And this woman was bent over. And she's standing there, probably in pain. And she, Jesus is saying, hey, this woman is a daughter of Abraham. So as a daughter of Abraham, Minimum blessing is healing. So she should be healed. They're saying, no, you can't heal on the Sabbath day. As a daughter of Abraham, Satan has bound her. There is one, the devil, who wants to deprive us of the new covenant provisions and blessings. right? So Satan has bound the, this woman who is in the old covenant. Jesus is saying, I don't care what day is it. Sabbath day, guilt offering day, sin offering. I don't care about all that. One thing I know is she is in the covenant. So we're going to pray for healing. Jesus says, be healed. Right? Look at this. Sometimes the devil wants to bring ignorance. Right? He keeps us in ignorance so that we don't know what the new covenant promises are. That's why we need the word. Sometimes he makes us to forsake it and forget the new covenant. Forget it. No, when, you're, when somebody is in the hospital, Sick. Right? And he said, Don't don't listen to that. That can't be done. Doctor is saying this. So the devil will help us make us focus. Oh, doctor said this. No. And he forgot the blessings. Jesus is saying this, but who's greater? Jesus or doctor? We gotta tell ourselves. Right? But the devil will try to make us forget this. He will seduce us. That means uh, uh, the enemy will. Lure us away to do wickedly against the covenant. He will, he will tell us, forget it. Why do you want to live all of this? Right? You know, what is this church on Sunday, church on Wednesday, Bible study, life group, cell group, uh, Bible college, morning prayer, evening prayer, only prayer, so boring life. When I look at my other friends, they are enjoying, they're taking bike, they're going for long ride, they're taking the cars, they're going for long drive. They're all enjoying themselves. And I'm here studying the Bible the whole day. So the devil will say, oh, no, who's asking you to study? Do what you want to do. It's OK. I know. See, everyone are traveling. Everyone are enjoying. He will try to lure you away from the things of God. right? And he will bring dishonor on the covenant. But here's the thing, point number four, keep your, the covenant in your mouth everyone say that keep the covenant in your mouth everyone say miracle the miracle is in my mouth it is in your mouth that's why in the book of romans it says the word is near you 
it is in your heart and in your mouth. Put the covenant in your mouth. Keep it in your mouth. Look at the covenant and say, God, I will stand on the covenant. I feel weak. I feel sad. I feel everything. Nothing is going the way I planned for it. But I will keep my covenant in my mouth because life and death are in the power of the tongue. And sometimes we may say things, no? And then we say, oh, man, why did I say this? It's okay. See, as people, we may say things. Right? Go back to God, ask forgiveness. The number one, very another very important aspect for forgiveness is confession of sins. When we confess our sins, He will heal us. And he will bring healing upon us. He will, he will forgive our sins and heal all our diseases. Right? So keep the covenant of God's word in your mouth. How do I keep it in my mouth? I should read it, put it into my spirit. Then when I need it, the Holy Spirit will enable me to put it on my mouth. And that's why the word is so important. Right? Okay, we'll stop here. Next week, we will start with the cross. Okay, the cross and talk about the cross. All right, thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend. I'll see you next Friday. God bless you all.